I'm delighted to welcome our speaker tonight, Tony Scotland, who was born in Buckinghamshire, brought up in the West Indies and West Africa, and he was sent to boarding school in England at the age of six. Yeah. On leaving school, he became a reporter on the East Sussex Gazette before emigrating to Australia at the age of 19, where he worked on the Sydney Morning Herald and then as a television reporter for ABC in Hobart, Tasmania. Returning to England in 1968, he joined BBC television as a reporter and presenter. And in 1992, Tony joined the new classic FM and was soon heard presenting operas and reading his way through the Old Testament on Sunday mornings. <laughs> Since resigning from classic FM in 1998, Tony has worked as a freelance writer and he's had numerous articles published in The Spectator, Harper's and Queen, Sunday Telegraph, The Independent, House and Garden, the BBC History Magazine, and many others. As well as music, his interest includes history and foreign travel. And it was while visiting China with the BBC Symphony Orchestra in 1981 that he first became fascinated by the decline of the Manchu dynasty and the startling transformation from feudal, feudal imperialism to communism, which led to his first book, The Empty Throne, The Quest for an Imperial Heir to the, to the People's Republic of China. Tony Scotland has written seven other books, several with a musical theme, including Flesh, Beef, Brief Encounter with Stravinsky, Wolf, Britain's Young Apollo, and of course his latest book, which we'll be hearing about tonight, Tomasino, The Enigma of the English Mozart. Tomasino, or Tom, was born in Abbey Green, Bath, the eldest son of the composer and musical director of the New Bath Assembly Rooms, Thomas Linley. The musicologist Charles Burney described this talented Bath family as a nest of nightingales. Many of us are aware of Tom's sister, the celebrated singer Elizabeth Lindley, later the wife of Sheridan, but not many of us know of her equally talented brother Tom, so I'm looking forward very much to hearing all about him. Please join me in welcoming Tony Scotland. Thank you very much, Maria Louise, and thank you very much for coming on this COVID night. Uh, I feel that we're very lucky to be in this beautiful building at the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution, 18 Queen Square, under these magnificent paintings painted by Casali at about the time that the young musician we're going to learn all about tonight, I hope, uh, was being brought up in Bath. Actually, these paintings weren't painted for here. They were painted for Alderman Beckford at, at Fontel, Fontel Splendens, and came here later. Uh, I do have some Bath connections myself, but rather a way back. Two of my great uh, grandfathers were clergymen in Bath. One was um, uh, the Archdeacon and a uh, very low church. And the other was the vicar of Bathwick and, and very high. And when uh, the daughter of one and the son of the other fell in love and decided they wanted to get married, both fathers were very much against it and tried to split them up and prevent it happening. But the feisty girl, my grandmother, simply put an ad in the local paper and said that marriage was going to happen, and it did. <laughs> Well, um, Bath's forgotten Mozart. In 1768, the winter continued well into the spring, so that Bath was surprised to find itself on the snow in early May. The two eldest of the celebrated Linley children of Orchard Street, south of the Abbey, were due up at the circus on the morning of the 11th. It was barely a mile from their house up to Lansdowne, and they were all set to walk it, but their mother didn't want them getting grubby because they were having their portraits painted. <laughs> so they took sedan chairs. With the paths so icy, rather like tonight, and building works going on everywhere, 
as Bath was transformed into a Georgian city, the pole men had to pick their way with special care. The Lindley's house was almost next door to the Theatre Royal, the old Theatre Royal, <coughs> now the Masonic Hall. From there, <coughs> excuse me, they skirted the building site at the end of Orchard Street. <coughs> Drink time. <laughs> <coughs> well, St. James's Church was going up. Marks and Spencer is there now. And they turned right into Stall Street, passing the baths and the pump room on the right, then across Borough Walls with the Mineral Water Hospital on the left hand corner, up into Milson Street, site of the fashionable new Octagon Chapel, where visitors could hire a fancy pew for the season complete with its own fireplace and easy chairs. <laughs> and soon they were in Gay Street with the circus immediately ahead. The grand ring of uh, Palladian townhouses designed by John Wood the Elder was still under construction, supervised by his son, but number 17 on the north side was finished and already occupied, and that's where they stopped. The children climbed out of their chairs, still a bit dazed after being tossed about in leather boxes for 20 minutes. They wiped the snow off their shoes on the scraper by the front door. It's still there as far as I could see. And a servant led them into the hall and through to the studio. There, Thomas Gainsborough was waiting for them. He was now rich from his society portraits, but when he first moved to Bath, he used to live around the corner from the Linleys, who were then in Abbey Green. He'd watched them grow up, and he had a soft spot for them all, especially Tom and Elizabeth. They were attractive, clever, and charming, and who could resist them? But they were musical prodigies, and Gainsborough revered music and musicians. He owned an impressive collection of instruments, which he bought from some of the great musicians of the period. Friends whose pictures he painted, the composers J.C. Bach and Carl Friedrich Arnold, the oboist Johann Christian Fischer, and the violinist Francesco Gimignani. He wasn't actually much of a performer himself, but he lived in hope that some of the magic of these virtuoso instruments would rub off on him. Gainsborough never missed any one of the Lindley concerts in Bath, particularly when Elizabeth was singing and Tom playing the violin, long before either of them was 10 years old. He'd recently painted their father, Thomas Lindley Sr., harpsichordist, bass, singing teacher, and concert impresario. He was the unofficial director of music in Bath throughout the 1760s and 70s, and a martinet, as you can perhaps tell from those steely eyes <laughs> and the set of the mouth. But till today, Gainsborough had never painted any of the Linley children, though he would go on to produce a dozen portraits of them eventually. Given his passion for music, he might have placed the children in a musical setting, with a harpsichord or a violin, in a concert hall, or holding a sheet of music as in that picture of their father. But instead, he had in mind what was then called a fancy picture a sentimental story painting. So a maid was sent to rummage in the dressing art box, and Tom and Elizabeth were transformed into a beggar boy and girl. <laughs> Rather chic beggars, that's what we said. Elizabeth was only 13, but looks much older, perhaps because like all her siblings, she'd been driven so hard and so fast by her ambitious and tyrannical father singing in public from a very early age and practicing every moment of the day. If she looks sadly distracted too, well, she's about to lose her little brother, Tom, her soulmate, who was off to Italy in a day or two to study with the violinist Pietro Nardini in Leghorn. And anyway, she's already suffering from the onset of the TB that will carry her and two of her sisters to early graves. All Gainsborough's paintings of Elizabeth show her with this nobly tragic look, 
and it appealed strongly to her male admirers, who included the king. Tom, who was only just 12, his birthday was four days before this, had something mischievous about him in the smile playing on that sensitive but determined mouth. And yet, like his sister, there's a wistfulness in his gray eyes, and he looks a little vulnerable as he nestles into his sister's shoulder. It's a wonderful painting, originally much larger than this, but cut down after Gainsborough sold it to the Duke of Dorset in 1784. And I've used it on the dust jacket of my new book, the first biography of Thomas Lindy Jr., violinist, composer, uh, singer, actor and dancer too, and childhood friend of Mozart. He was born, as we've said, in Abbey Green, and his father gave him an early, very early grounding in the theory and practice of music. So that by the age of five, he was singing, dancing, and playing the violin in public at his father's concerts in Hammond's rooms, around the corner from Orchard Street, at the new assembly rooms on Terrace Walk, overlooking the river. Lindley soon realized that Tom needed coaching at a higher level and he turned to one of the greatest English composers of the day, his friend, William Boyce, master of the King's music, and asked him if he would take the boy as an apprentice. Dr. Boyce was so captivated by what he called Tom's genius and disposition that he agreed to teach him counterpoint and composition with Latin and Greek for five years. So when the concert season in Bath came to an end in July, 1763, and every summer thereafter till 1768, Tom took the mail coach up to London to stay at the Boyce's in Kensington Gore. On Sundays, he used to walk two miles to the Chapel Royal in St. James's Palace to hear Dr. Boyce playing the organ and the boys in their uniforms of scarlet and gold singing in the Tudor Chapel. When Tom was 10, he was cast as Puck, the Larky Fairy, in a children's mask at the Covent Garden Theatre, specially written for the five-year-old Prince of Wales on his very first visit to a theatre. Tom's role involved playing the violin, acting, singing, and he brought the house down by dancing a hornpipe. The royal party loved it, and the boy was invited to Buckingham House, as it then was, to give a reprise. Among those present on both occasions was a rich and influential courtier, General Peregrine Barty, third Duke of Ancaster and hereditary Lord Great Chamberlain. He took a great shine to Tom. Both he and his wife loved music and they'd given a party for little Mozart when he was staying in London about this time. Now they offered their patronage to Tom and it was probably with their help that he was able to go to Italy. <laughs> we don't know who accompanied Tom on that long journey, but he couldn't have traveled on his own, aged just 12, speaking neither French nor Italian, though presumably a little Latin, and having no notion of how to barter with innkeepers and, and, and uh, hostlers, nor the wherewithal to protect himself from highwaymen and thieves. It's easy to forget today what an arduous, uncomfortable and dangerous journey the Grand Tour involved. Across the channel by packet boat, picking up a four-wheeled postcoach for Paris via Ville, and traveling on with overnight stops to Lyon, Geneva and the Savoie. From there, Tom and his companion crossed the Alps by the Mont Cenis Pass, sitting on mules for six days. In Novelese, their bags were opened and searched by Sardinian customs before they hired a coach to Turin and on to Genoa and down the Mediterranean coast via Pisa to the port of Livorno, or Legon as the British called it. In all, a journey of about a thousand miles, taking a good two months, with a week or two to get over the shock of being bumped about in springless carriages in all weathers, with overnight stops in unheated inns, fleas in their beds and limited rations. Tom arrived in Livorno in the middle of a drought with fever raging in the city. 
But Nardini's villa was just outside the city and safe. And the famous violinist gave Tom a warm welcome. Pietro Nardini was as soft-hearted as the music that he wrote for his instrument. And he felt an immediate rapport with his new English pupil, talented, bright-eyed, and exactly the same age as he himself, when he traveled north to Padua 34 years earlier to begin his studies with Tartini, the composer of that Devil's Troll Sonata. One day, the French consul invited Nardini and Tom to his palazzo for a conversazione, at which they both played. It was the first time that Tom had heard his master in concert, and it gave him a chance to study his magic bow, which was said to produce sounds closer to the human voice than to a violin, sounds so passionately Italian and affecting that Nardini himself sometimes shed tears that ran down his cheeks and onto his violin. Slow, sad movements were his speciality and soon became Tom's too. Even before he left England, Tom had written six violin sonatas, and now he wrote a seventh. Inspired by his master's play and by the European craze for all things Scottish. We'll hear the middle movement, which shows something of Tom's extraordinary technical command. Elizabeth Valfish and the Locatelli Trio on that Hyperion recording. Tom remained in Livorno for two years until the spring of 1770, when Nardini was appointed court violinist to the Grand Duke of Tuscany. That's him there on the left, Pietro Leopoldo, with his brother Joseph, the Holy Roman Emperor. So now Nardini and Tom moved inland to the great Renaissance city of Florence. In his highly paid new job, Nardini was expected to perform as a soloist, as well as playing with the court orchestra and its chamber groups. And under his leadership, Florentine music rose to fame throughout Europe. Here too, Tom gave concerts for the Grand Duke and for the English melody, so conspicuous in Florence at the time. Here are some of them at dinner with the British plenipotentiary, the eccentric but kindly and profoundly musical Sir Horace Mann, sitting at the head of his table, raising a glass to a new arrival in the city, the writer James Boswell on the left. 
The stout man in red sitting facing us is Lord Tilney, who had had to leave England in a hurry when he was discovered in what a contemporary account describes as the consummation of an amour after the manner of Tiberius, with two of his manservants at one and the same time. <laughs> Seated behind him in blue, looking towards Sir Horace Mann, is Lord Cooper, one of the richest men in Europe, who maintained his own orchestra and brought Handel's operas and oratorios to Florence. He too is reported to have practiced unmanly vices. Ditto, actually, the painter of the satirical picture himself, Thomas Patch. Somehow, pretty young Tom was self-assured enough to steer a safe course through all these exalted characters. And in 1771, now 13, I think it was 1771, I think it's 1770, he met in Florence the great wonder of the times. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. As birds of a feather, for they were both prodigies who had been raised in a hothouse of despotic and pushy fathers, the two boys fell into one another's arms. According to Mozart's father, Leopold, for a whole week they spent as much time embracing as making music. The music historian Charles Burney happened to be in Florence at this time, and he spent time with them both and wrote that the Tomasino, as Tom was known, and the little Mozart are talked of all over Italy as the most promising geniuses of this age. Both boys played the violin and composed. Both were the same height and the same build. Both were exactly the same age. Both were as childlike in behavior as adults in intellect. They were bright and observant, full of fun, well aware of their prestige as Wunderkinder and not a little cocky. Furthermore, Tom was English and Wolfgang loved the English. He used to say that though he was born in Salzburg, he was really an Erzengelender, an out and out Englishman. One evening, they were invited to make music with a French family in Florence. And Leopold reported to his wife that they played not like boys, but like masters. This anonymous painting is a record of the occasion. The hosts presiding proudly while their son stands singing. Wolfgang is sitting at a spinet and Tom is playing what looks like a viola. The company of a boy is so like himself, the music making, the talking, the games, above all the equality of the friendship meant so much to little Tom Lindy that he never forgot that week. And on the last night, he couldn't bear to say goodbye. Leopold Mozart wrote to his wife, little Tommaso wept bitter tears because we were leaving on the following day. They'd hoped to stay longer, but wanted to reach Rome in time for the Holy Week ceremonies of the Vatican. Instead of going home to Nardini's that night, Tom pulled in at a house around the corner and uh, he needed a shoulder to cry on. And he was sure to find it, he knew, at number two, Via della Forca, home of the court poet Corilla Olympica. She was famous in Tuscany as an improvising poet, violinist, a pupil of Nardini, and a woman of the world. She was a friend of Casanova, possibly a mistress of the Grand Duke. Warm, loving, and uninhibited, she'd taken young Tom under her wing since his arrival in Florence. And to her, he poured out all his feelings about his joy at finding his first real friend and his grief at losing him so suddenly. The romantic Carilla was moved to compose a poem expressing all these feelings. Perhaps she asked Tom to play one of his adagios on his violin while she worked for her dramatic improvisations always seem to have involved some musical inspiration. When the poem had formed itself in her mind, she wrote it down and told Tom that she conceived it as a farewell. She instructed him to take it home, copy it out in his own hand in Italian, sign it at the bottom and deliver it to Signor Wolfgangel 
before he left for Rome in the morning. With the poem folded in his pocket, Tom walked home, picking his way over the paving stones of the dark and narrow old streets. Back in his chamber, he carefully copied out the loving phrases and then tossed and turned restlessly till dawn. After breakfast on Friday the 6th of April, 1770, he took the poem around to the inn. Arriving at nine, he found that the Mozarts were still having their breakfast because they decided to postpone their departure until midday. With many embraces, we're told, he presented the poem and watched as his friend read it aloud through his tears. It's pretty fruity stuff for Corinna and Impica was a poet in a consciously classical mold. But even if the words weren't quite Tom's, the feelings certainly were. On the departure of Signor Amadeo Wolfgang Mozart from Florence, since fate has divided us, I can follow you only in my thoughts. All joy and laughter replaced by melancholy. But in the midst of sadness, a hope will meet again. And then the third stanza, oh, happy day, oh, lucky moment, in which at Tornito, astonished, I saw and heard you and became the lover of your powers. May the gods decree that from your heart I never shall fall. I will love you constantly and follow you always. Tommaso Lindy. While the servants packed the bags and Leopold went around their rooms checking that nothing was left behind, the boys talked and made music for the last time, exchanging all the promises of parting friends. By 12, the four-seater open carriage was loaded up, some of the luggage strapped to the back, the rest with the instruments on and under the two spare seats. Leopold paid the bill at the end, at the inn, uh, say goodbye to Tom, and the boys had more hugs. Then the two horses set off, but Tom didn't just stand there waving from the inn's coach house. He ran alongside the carriage, still talking to Wolfgang through the quarter lights. On and on he trotted, trotted beside them, all the way across the Arno by the Ponte Vecchio, down to the Palazzo Pitti, along the edge of the Giardino di Boboli, till they reached the great Porta Romana, the southernmost gate in the old city walls. For positively the last time, the two young friends embraced, with more goodbyes and tears, as Leopold paid the gate fee and the custom house officer searched the Mozart's bags, warning that there would be further searches once they reached the territories of the Pope. At last, the coachman flicked his whip and the carriage moved off, picking up the road south via the Grand Duke's Villa del Poggio Imperiale, where the boys had played before the entire court earlier in the week, and on down through the hills of vines and olives to Rome, 200 miles and, and five days away. Alone now, Tom turned sadly back to Florence, and back to Corilla's house. Leopold was so deeply moved by the English boy's devotion that he thought about it all the way to Rome, and it was still on his mind three days later when he wrote home to tell his wife the whole story, wishing she'd been with him to see for herself the boy's love for one another. Meanwhile, back home in Bath, there was trouble brewing. As the Lindis became the focus of a drama, that was soon to fill the scandal sheets. Pursued by suitors wherever she went, the beautiful Elizabeth, now 17, and star of the oratorio seasons in London, had fallen in love with the penniless playwright Richard Brinsley Sheridan. But her father wanted her to marry an elderly bachelor with a huge fortune, Walter Long of South Raxall, seven miles east of the earth. Without telling her father, Elizabeth wrote to the old gentleman, saying she was terribly sorry, but she simply could never love him. Whereupon he honorably backed down. But Lindley Senior 
rather less honorably sued him for breach of contract. And in compensation, generous old Long gave him 3,000 pounds, staggering sum in those days, possibly a quarter of a million a day. Bath and London talked of nothing else. And the one-legged actor and satirical playwright Samuel Foote sent it all up in a new farce for the Haymarket Theatre, The Maid of Bath, which became the hit of the season. Just at this moment, Tom arrived back from Italy and found himself caught up in the next act of the Lindley drama. On the night of the 18th of March, 1772, when the Lindleys were supposed to be rehearsing a Handel oratorio in Bristol, Elizabeth and Sheridan gave them the slip and eloped via London and Dover to France. Weeks later, Lindley tracked them down to Lille, where they were living respectably with the doctor's family. He dragged them home to Bath separately and kept them strictly apart. And there's more. Another of Elizabeth's suitors insulted Sheridan, who challenged him to a duel. And while Elizabeth was singing Handel in Oxford, unknown to her, these two men were rolling around on King's Down, hacking at each other with bits of broken sword. Sheridan was badly wounded, but his sisters nursed him back to health in Bath. And then he was sent away to Essex to read for the bar and to forget all about Elizabeth, who stayed home in Orchard Street under close supervision. Tom cheered her up with his violin, and Gainsborough has left a sketch, which may show them making music together. If it is the Lindley's, and there's no absolute guarantee, but it's thought that it might be, then that's Tom playing the violin. Elizabeth singing, another sister accompanying at the harpsichord, and brother Samuel, soon to join the Navy, standing with his oboe on the far side. Well, beneath the harpsichord, a creature is listening intently. Presumably it's a dog, but it could be a cat or even the latest of Mrs. Lindley's 12 children. Mm -hmm. Gainsborough now painted a formal portrait of Tom. <clears throat> He's looking pale and trim and rather buttoned up, even a little self-satisfied. The hint of a smile on his lips but his eyes still watchful and guarded. Under his arm, he tucked his cocked hat as a mark of his new status, no longer a servant musician, but now a young gentleman. Lindley Senior, prosperous from teaching, playing, and charging vast fees for his children's performances, has raised his own social status by moving from Orchard Street to one of the smartest addresses in Bath, the Crescent not yet the Royal Crescent. Proudly, he presented his eldest son of the city as leader of his orchestra and star service. Still only 16, Tom now wrote the first of 20 violin concertos. Only one survives with a beautiful middle movement and a dodger of the kind he loved and had learned to perfect in it. Elizabeth Valfish and the Parlier Instruments conducted by Peter Holman. It's so beautifully crafted that music, it's amazing to think that he could have written it so young. But he didn't write only pretty music, as we'll hear later. Tom's music and Elizabeth's looks and voice had put the Lindley family firmly on the map. And concert halls everywhere were clamoring for them. 
The actor David Garrick tried to hire them for his opera season at the Theatre Royal Drury Lane. But Lindley refused to release them unless he went too, as protector and backer. And even then only for oratoria, certainly not for acting on a stage, heaven forbid. Garrick decided that supervised Lindley's were better than no Lindley's, Lindley's at all. So they all went up to London. Tom, as leader of the theatre orchestra and resident composer, Elizabeth as soprano soloist and the big draw, Mr. Lindley as music director, and Mrs. Lindley as wardrobe mistress. And such a penny pinching one that she used to cut lengths off the diva's dresses to cover her new cushions. <laughs> and now, as well as writing instrumental works for performances in the intervals of the oratorios in the tradition of Handel himself, Tom turned his attention to larger scale works. First, he wrote an anthem for the Three Choirs Festival, then an oratorio, The Song of Moses. Meanwhile, another development on the last front. Although Elizabeth remained under family guard, Sheridan galloped up to London one afternoon, forced his way into the Drury Lane Theatre, and burst into Elizabeth's dressing room. Mm -hmm. When he declared his love, she declared hers, and before anyone could call Mr. Lindley, they were married. <laughs> it wasn't the happiest of unions because Sheridan refused to allow Elizabeth ever to sing again. Too unladylike, he said, too arousing. Instead, he kept her for himself at home while he ran amok among his lady admirers. Elizabeth eventually followed his example and had an affair, had a baby, with the Irish rebel Lord Edward Fitzgerald. But Lindley Senior could see the marriage made commercial sense by uniting the literature of the Sheridans with the music of the Lindys. And in 1775, Tom and Sheridan collaborated on a comic opera called The Duenna, which became one of the most successful operas ever staged in England. Sheridan then went on to write the first of his stage comedies, The Rivals, and Tom composed a Shakespeare ode. Both were hits. Then they collaborated again on a new production of The Tempest. And for the first scene of Act One, when the sorcerer Prospero conjures up the storm, which shipwrecks the treacherous Antonio, Tom wrote a magnificent chorus. It's one of his greatest compositions and still played today. Arise, ye spirits of the storm.
the Baroque orchestra and chorus of the Parliament instruments conducted Paul Nicholson. Tom Lindley and Richard Sheridan were the lions of London, and the future looked bright for further collaborations, particularly when Garrick retired and Sheridan and Lindley Sr. bought from him the Theatre Royal Drury Lane. To celebrate, Tom wrote a new comic opera, The Cady of Baghdad. The critics hated the libretto, but they loved the music, all except one critic who had it in for Tom. The anonymous reviewer of the Westminster magazine complained irrelevantly and not for the first time that Thomas Lindley Jr. might be an inventive and talented composer and a virtuoso violinist but his on-stage manner was offensive. <laughs> he was pretty, conceited, and feminine. In the context of the times, the implication was clear. Tom was a molly, a fribble, a daffodil, one of them. There's no other source to back this up, but we know that his father was pressing him to marry and encouraging Sheridan to give him some wholesome advice, presumably about the joys of ladies. But Tom had had enough of his controlling father and the vicious attacks of this vindictive critic, which could have led to his arrest and imprisonment possibly. Thoroughly overworked and tired, he fell into a depression and disappeared for a month or two. Just at this moment, Goethe's novel, The Sorrows of Young Bertin, came out. And Tom immediately seized on it, recognizing himself as its melancholy hero, the romantic poet Bertin. Whether or not uh, Tom, like Bertin, suffered from unrequited love, he certainly felt that he was an outsider, an artist, lonely, misunderstood. And he realized now that there were others like him. And so following their example, he took to wearing Werther's outfit of blue coat and yellow breeches, which is how the Bath artist Isaiah Humphrey painted him in 1778. This portrait is now in the Victoria Art Gallery with other Lindley portraits by Humphrey, well worth a visit. The only person who could have helped Tom was his sister Elizabeth, with whom he used to share all his secrets. But Sheridan now kept her on such a tight rein that she was pretty well inaccessible. Perhaps Tom turned to his patron, the Duke of Ancaster. He had always been sympathetic and might have recognized the symptoms of Tom's troubles. He had lately been tarred with much the same brush, accused very directly of committing the sin of Sodom, without it should be said much evidence, but without any denial either. At all events, in 1778, after reviewing his Lincolnshire militia in the presence of the king, the Duke of Ancaster invited Tom, now 22, to spend the summer in Lincolnshire at Grimsthorpe Castle, one of the great houses in England, Part Tudor, part Baroque. Its grand north front designed by Vanbra, its park designed by Capability Brian. On the morning of the 5th of August, 1778, Tom put on his great coat and his top boots. No one knew why he insisted on wearing winter clothes at the height of summer. And with an Italian friend, he walked down through the park to take one of the Duke's boats for a sail on the Great Water. According to the newspapers, a sudden squall blew up. The boat keeled over and began to sink as water poured in. The Italian, who couldn't swim, got into a panic. Tom dived in great coat, top boots and all, and tried to make for the bank to fetch help, but sank under the weight of his clothes and drowned in the mud. 
The Duchess of Ancaster, who was watching from her dressing room on the first floor of the castle, saw it all and set the servants down to the lake. But it was too late. That's the story, but it may not have happened like that. Early this year, I found a small bound 18th century manuscript in the British Library, which claimed to be an eyewitness account written by the Italian who was with Tom in the boat that day. Second line down, he writes, in the summer, I went into the country with his grace, where I found one Signor Linley, a young man of a great merit in the musical way. In the morning of the 5th of August, this young man came in my apartment and invited me to go with him in one of his grace's pleasure boats. I was not willing to go, as I could not swim. But having excused myself above half an hour, to no purpose, I went with him and the waterman. The manuscript ought to hold the secret. The catalogue says it does, but it doesn't. It only thickens the plot. The cover gives a macabre clue about the surprise that lies within. Can you see it, I wonder? Bottom left, mm -hmm. lost in the marbling, nearly two skulls. So was it an accident? Or suicide? Or something else? However he died, poor troubled Tom is all but forgotten today. No papers surviving, most of his music destroyed or lost. Just Gainsborough's portraits to remind us that he existed. But Tom's childhood friend, Wolfgang Mozart, never forgot him. Talking to the Irish tenor Michael Kelly at a musical evening in Vienna about five years later, Mozart said that Thomas Lindley was a true genius who would have become one of the greatest ornaments of the musical world if he had lived. It's all in my book. <laughs> you happen to take questions. That's what I did. Thank you. That was wonderful, I think. Really, uh, so nice to hear that music. Maybe really, there was a lot more. Yes. Yeah. Do we have any questions? We used to be using the microphones, please, so that people are to do it. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Thank you for an unforgettable talk that you've given us on the line. Totally enjoyed. Um, what? At the time of his death, was the name given to this horrible disease, the day called TB, which uh, he was dead at the time you had died from? Was it consumption or what was it called? Actually, neither consumption nor TB, as we call that disease today, uh, was ever mentioned in relation to the death of Tom. It certainly was to his three sisters, and it's always thought that it was inherited and that it was in the family. And some people have subsequently uh, suggested that perhaps Tom uh, was afflicted as well. But at the time, in the press, there was no mention of it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Tony, I think you brought you brought him back to life this evening. Yes, actually. I think your book and your talk this evening has brought little Tommy back into our lives. So very beautiful. I've got one sort of burning question. You've done you've done a huge amount of research into this. Did you look for the lost violin concertos? Because if we could just find those, I mean, 
is magic, but then suddenly we be he would really come back to life, but we, we, he would definitely be on Platic FM. <laughs> and, uh, or on Radio 3, where I was for 20 years before Classic FM, actually. But yes, uh, I haven't looked for them because um, musicologists, scholars of very much uh, greater worth than I have uh, dug around for years and years and haven't been able to find anything. There is one left, the complete concerto we just heard, the, the middle movement there, and just one of the sonatas. And uh, there are two or three choral works, and the Pali of Instruments have recorded them on Hyperion. And you should try and track them down. They're wonderful recordings, and of course, it's fantastic music. But I, I sometimes things reappear, perhaps they will. The thing was, I think at the time, uh, scores weren't really valued. You produced your music and it went back in the library or back in the, in the cupboard. Maybe it'd be played again later. Quite a lot of them, quite a lot of Tom scores were lost in the fire of 89, uh, which destroyed the, the, the Drury Lane Theatre. It's also been suggested that maybe the family, for some reason, wanted rather to forget about Tom. Maybe they felt that the Westminster magazine was onto something and it was all too embarrassing and better forgotten about. But that said, Father Lindley was absolutely devastated. He really never did recover for all that he was steely and hard and, and, and ambitious. He never really recovered from the death of this son of, of whom he had such high hopes. <clears throat> Thank you for that. One feels that there's at least one film, possibly two or three, in these bands uh, scoring. What first gave you the idea of the, the book, basically? And, and, and also, could you go a little into the connection with the, with the publisher, Shelf Bands? Thank you. Yes, well, uh, about two books ago, um, a book called Jim Crack. Uh, I was writing about a, a Scottish rake called uh, the Earl of Seaforth. And um, he had an apartment in Naples in the 1760s and 70s, early 70s. And uh, there's a painting. He, he was a great uh, connoisseur and buyer of paintings, like so many of the grand tourists were. And he had lots and lots of money. Um, and uh, there's a painting of um, a musical evening in his apartment. And he's standing with his back to us. I don't think he's conducting, but he's maybe reading the score. And Jomelli, uh, the great violinist of the Persian, is on his right. And um, uh, Sir William Hamilton, the ambassador, is on his left, um, and there are two figures at uh, a harpsichord in the background, actually uh, one harpsichord and a smaller keyboard instrument, back. and it says that those are Leopold and Wolfgang Mozart playing for him that evening in 1770. And I discovered that um, that I did quite a bit of research and worked out that the clothes matched the descriptions that Leopold had um, written, but they were both, Leopold and Wolfgang were very keen on their clothes and constantly wrote back to Mrs. Mozart to describe what was going on. Would she please send another bit of cloth because it was a bit of a hole in his trousers and all the rest of it. And this event, this evening, took place three weeks after Mozart had been in Florence with Lindley. And I had never known about that before, but I was so touched by the story of uh, Lindley and Mozart in Florence and little, Mo little Lindley following that coach all the way out of the city that I thought I must write about this. Mm. So that's how that happened. Mm. <laughs> okay. Shell flies. Oh, shell flies. Shell flies. Well, uh, after my first book, which was 
so completely different. It's, it's sort of shaggy dog stories, searching for the heir of the last emperor of China, um, and digging around in, in, in the, the grubby remains of the Manchu dynasty at its decline at the turn of the century. Um, Penguin published it, and um, I had hoped that I would be able to do future books with them, but it didn't work out like that. I did a book which has never been published, uh, uh, a journey through Eastern Europe just before the Iron Curtain, uh, before communism collapsed. And uh, um, I, 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 printing has been one of my hobbies, never printed a book, but uh, I used to put letter heads and uh, um, the line drawings, one sort or another. And I had a lovely old uh, Arab uh, platinum printing press. And uh, I felt very strongly that a book is more than just words in it. It's also the paper and the layout and, and the typeface, the font and, and the dust jacket and everything else. And I wanted to produce my own books to answer in a very lengthy way your kind of question. Mm -hmm. And so shelf lies is me. In fact, <laughs> did, did Mozart and um, Lindley did they ever write to each other after that meeting? Did they? Yes. And where is the where are the letters? Yes, it's a good question. Uh, the letter letters from Lindley uh, to Mozart have disappeared also, um, but there is one letter from Mozart. He's terribly busy with his father then. Um, trying to get work in the great courts of Italy, and no time for writing letters. But eventually on the way home to Salzburg, in I think Bologna, um, Wolfgang does write and say, I'm terribly sorry, I haven't been in touch, I've been frustrated, busy. Uh, I had hoped that I could come back via Florence to see you again, mm -hmm. um, but it's not going to work out like that. Mm -hmm. So there's that one letter, which I think is in the museum in Salzburg, and it's thought that there might have been others, but they, they've gone. They've gone. They've Thank been. you. Thank you. Uh, we just happened to walk by and see this, and of course, it's a ripping title. Um, it, does that do anything to bring out uh, the Lindley? Um, history or like, promote it? I mean, they're promoting Jane Austen, they? and they're in Shelley even. But what about, I mean, yeah, the one that they can promote as well, and, and why aren't they if they're not? It would, and uh, we must do something about it. I quite agree with you. You and I get together. <laughs> this meeting is the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. There's a clock on the door of the house. <laughs> But we do have lectures here. We've had a lecture on uh, it is a little lonely. So we do have lectures on on, on Bath, you know, who was here important in Bath. Yeah, I would like to answer that last question I'm involved with the Persian um, Society and lectures on astronomy and so on. We've just celebrated the bicentenary of uh, William Bush's death. And we had a concert uh, mainly for uh, William Bush in music because he was a musician and one of the main astronomer. But we did include uh, at least one piece by Lindy. I can't tell you which of the. Uh, was the Thomas uh, Lindy senior also the composer? Yes, he was. Yes. I uh, can't say which. Then we, have, we did have a piece performed. Well, it's very interesting to hear that. Uh, I rather naughtily cut corners in this uh, talk by describing at one point Linley Senior as being the unofficial director of music in Bath. Of course, there was Herschel up there in the oct Octagon Chapel. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and a very powerful force he was as well with his own family. They fell out, if I remember, over a music stand. I think Herschel felt that a music stand should have been provided for him, and Lindley had failed to do it, and they never spoke again. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>
You mentioned uh, Elizabeth Lindley's elephant. Yes. And in fact, the plant in Bath actually said that. And that's interesting. Bath and Bath, I think that tells you something about the person who lived there. Um, but uh, when she left, it was because it's basically to get away from Captain Matthews. And I think she kind of pitched it beforehand. And I have a feeling the sister was in on that. Was Thomas in on it as well? I mean, did they try and sort of engineer it to uh, distract their parents rather than two of them got away? I think that is exactly what happened. I agree with you. Um, she had been planning it for a long while. It, to call it an elopement is, is not quite accurate. She hadn't planned to elope with, um, with, with Sheridan. Uh, she quite fancied him, I think, but I don't think she'd yet fallen in love with him. Um, but he was the guy who was going to escort her. Uh, it, it's a noble role. And um, everything was above board, everybody said. That's why Lindley was prepared to bring them back. And although he parted them, uh, scandal was avoided. Everybody felt that things had been proper. Question. In your research, did you come across any overlap between uh, uh, the, the, the Lindis and uh, the Beckfords, Thomas, uh, Alderman Beckford, or yes. William Thomas? Not, uh, not Alderman Beckford, uh, for whom these were painted. Yeah, yeah. No. Uh, but um, there was a Beckford traveling in Italy at the time uh, who was a friend of, uh, of, of Boswell and of uh, William Hamilton. And he certainly comes into my uh, book, Jim Crack. Um, I don't think he gets much of a mention in this book. He didn't play any particular part. I don't think there's any record that young Tom uh, met him. But yes, Beckford's a big, aren't they? And lots to be said about all of them, and rich. Any other questions? While I'm idly looking on the internet the other day, I came across the fact that Emma Hamilton, or Emma, later Lady Hamilton, worked for Thomas Lindley. Yes. Uh, when she was a teenager. Yeah. Have you come across that? Yes. Was, there any, uh, was, he, was, was she a lady in their house, or was she working at the theatre? Uh, when she was perhaps 12, 13, just come down, from the North Country, Yorkshire, I think. Um, and she got a job with a doctor. And <coughs> then Mrs. Lindley, uh, when they were at the Theatre Royal Drury Lane and living in Norfolk Street, needed some further help in the house. And she employed this very beautiful little girl. And there's quite a story about it. She was called, I think, Amy Lyon at the time, not Emma even. And what I haven't told you is that Tom's younger brother, Samuel, who I mentioned at one point plays the oboe, and he was very good looking boy, better than Tom, and very musical. And he decided to join the Navy and just leave music behind. And in 1778, the same year as Tom died, uh, his ship put into Portsmouth and he was sent back to London very ill. And a Amy Lyon nursed him and they fell in love. Uh, and then uh, the captain of the ship called him back and he'd, he'd recovered a bit enough to go back to sea. And then he got ill again almost the moment he got back on board ship and went back to London. And Amy was so pleased to see him. And he died within a couple of days. And she was completely distraught. She'd never had any sort of relationship like this before. And she wouldn't go to the funeral. She walked out of the house and was never seen again. But a friend of the family saw her a couple of days later in 
in, in Covent Garden, which was a great hall for brothels. And he, he said, uh, I remember you, you're, you work for Mrs. Lindy. And uh, he, he said, let, come back and, and let's talk. And they made an appointment, but she never, she never turned up. And the next thing was that she'd been picked up by um, the abbess of a brothel, they were called abbesses, uh, called Mrs. Kelly, I think. And she uh, turned her into a, a first-rate courtesan, and she was uh, taken up by, um, by a baronet whose name I can't remember who exploited her and used her. She was passed around from pillar to post, and eventually she ended up with William Hamilton's uh, nephew. And he needed to get rid of her after a while because he wanted to marry and he couldn't marry a courtesan. So he suggested to his uncle that she should go out to Naples um, and perhaps work for him. And she was quite polished by then, very beautiful. And she did these attitudes, you remember. Um, and you, you know the rest of the story. William Hamilton fell in love with her, then said so Nelson, etc., etc., etc. Thank you for asking the question. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. 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 Well, I think that was a wonderful evening, and um, I think I just wish he'd lived a bit longer. We could have heard a bit more of his music. I'm sure he had so much more to offer. It's all lost. Yes. Anyway, thank you so much. That's fun. Thank you. Mm -hmm.